Okay, so some hemostasis. Now, the first thing I want to do is talk about some coagulation tests. You got the PT and the PTT. Very misunderstood things by almost every medical student. So let's go over these thoroughly. The PT is the prothrombin time. What does that do? That evaluates the extrinsic system. So that means that's factors 7, 10, 5, 2, and 1. Now, the normal PT or the normal prothrombin time is 10 to 12 seconds. That's normal. Now, we developed something called the international normalized ratio, which is also known as the INR. Um, and to be a standardized value for the prothrombin time. And it's often um, quoted for warfarin therapy, not heparin therapy. This one's usually quoted for warfarin therapy. The INR, we're usually talking about warfarin. Warfarin therapy. <clears throat> okay, and now the normal INR is 1, 1.0. That is... That is the normal INR. So any an elevated INR, you usually when you, you're going to get pimped on this, I guarantee you in the hospital, an INR is going to be something like, they're going to say, what do you want your INR to be when you got a patient on warfarin? And you're going to answer them and say two to three. So two to three is what you want the INR to be. But what does that actually mean? Whenever you have an elevated international normalized ratio, that means you have a relative increase in anticoagulation. So there's an increase in, um, there, there's a decreased chance. Not, I don't like saying increase. There's a decreased chance of clotting. So I hope that explains the, uh, the INR much, much better than it's been explained previously probably to you. Um, all right, so the partial thromboplastin time, that's also known as the PT, that evaluates the intrinsic system. So that's talking about factors 12, 11, 9, 10, 5, Two, one, and eight. Okay, and so what do we want the partial thromboplastin time to be? This one is a little bit different. This one is between you, normal is 25 to 40 seconds. That's normal. Now, PTT, partial thromboplastin time, is used to measure heparin. Okay, but now be careful there because not low molecular weight heparin, such as like in oxoparin therapy. You can't use um, PTT to follow the heparin, the low molecular weight heparin. That's why it was developed in the first place. So you see, and I want you to know you see an increased PTT with a couple certain diseases, especially you'll see an increased PTT with uh, certain things like uh, DIC, on Willebrand's disease, that's a big one. Remember that one. And uh, anti phospholipid antibody syndrome associated with lupus. So, if you, and another thing, if you ever see increased PTT bleeding time, and I didn't even go over this, but I know you know this. Anytime you have a bleeding time thing, that's a platelet problem, right? So you'll be bleeding from where? Skin and mucosal surfaces. That can only be von Willebrand's factor disease or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Anytime you see increased PTT or bleeding time. So if on the USMLE or the complex, if you see increased PTT, bam, DIC, von Willebrand's factor, Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, lupus, something along those lines. There you go. You're done.
Okay, so moving along from there, now that we understand PT and PTT the way we should, primary hemostasis. What does that mean? The whole point of this is forming the platelet plug. All right, and no, like it says in the pathoma, this is a weak formation of a platelet plug. That's and when when does this happen? It's whenever you have endothelial injury. So if we have an endothelium here and we break we break it right here, we break this endothelium. The collagen now uh, underlying this, the underlying collagen is exposed right here. So the whole endo, now a whole set of things start to happen and platelets are going to start hearing. But the way that that had, that's called platelet adhesion, by the way, not aggregation. That's a whole different thing. This is platelet adhesion. So now that we understand that a little bit, let's talk about what happens there. When you get endothelial injury, say you get cut or something, you get that uh, subendothelial collagen exposed remember collagen um, there's all kinds of types but subendothelial collagen for what it's worth platelets adhere to what von willebrand's factor in where the subendothelium now we got to talk about von willebrand's factor cool thing we know that he is synthesized where in the endothelial cells but he's also synthesized in the megakaryocytes so he's going to bind to something called g P1B. That's what von Willebrand's factor. So if we redrew this, GP1B would be sitting right here. Von Willebrand's factor that's made in these endothelial cells right here is going to bind to that right there. So now that we know that, there's also um, there's also another thing you need to know here. For a very brief moment in time, there's an arterial vasoconstriction, and it's mediated by something called endothelium. A lot of people don't know this, and I think I've actually seen a question about this before. Endothelium, that's what causes this very brief um, arterial vasoconstriction. So you need to know that after you cut that and you expose that collagen, it's not like all oh, platelets just start adhering and all of a sudden, no. There's a, there, for a brief second in time, there's an arterial vasoconstriction in you. That's really important to understand, and it's all done through endothelium, um, which comes from endothelial cells. So they're not just wobble palatal bodies making all this stuff. It's, it's endothelium that initiates this whole process. And moving right along. So we got endothelial injury. We got adhesion. Adhesion. So when a, when platelets bind, that also activates them to release their granules. See, platelets got these granules in them. They got different kinds of granules, which we're going to talk about. But they contain key elements. I'm going to type a few of them in for you here. Um, thromboxane, A2 is one of them. ADP. Is another one. Calcium is involved in this, um, as well as surprisingly, serotonin. I don't even know if I spelled that right, but it doesn't matter. So, what do each of these do? This thromboxane right here. The reason this is important, the thromboxane, he actually activates more platelets. So that's platelets activating platelets and causes vasoconstriction, therefore increasing aggregation, not adhesion. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. ADP and calcium, those what those two things do is they increase the glycoprotein 2B3A's binding of what? Fibrinogen. So let me change the color right here. ADP and calcium, these two guys right here. Are involved in fibrinogen. So just think fibrinogen whenever you think ADP and calcium. Thromboxane A2, I want you to think platelets activating platelets. Okay. Serotonin, what it does is it enhances the overall platelet procoagulability mechanism. Okay. Now there's a lot of debate about this, so that means you're not going to be tested on it, but just know that serotonin is involved. The main things you need to know is separate 
from boxane A2, from ADP and calcium. ADP and calcium, I think that's what helps fibrinogen and stick to the glyco-2P3A from boxane A2, that's platelets activating platelets. And like we said right here, this is from boxane A2. Platelets activating more platelets. That's how that works. Now, the role of ADP. The role, all right, so what's ADP's role right here? ADP, what he does in platelet activation, ADP binds to receptors on the platelet surface, causing the insertion, okay, the insertion of glycoprotein 2B3A. And what's that going to do? That's the fibrinogen receptor. Do you see how all this is starting to work? So this is involved in, ADP is involved in platelet aggregation, not platelet adhesion. So this allows more aggregation of platelets. That's what ADP, we need energy in the form of ADP. So antiplatelet agents like to, to clopidine or clopidogrel, they block these ADP receptors and thus they inhibit this glyco-2B3A. That's how those two drugs work. Let me write those in there for you. Um, I clop o gene clopidogrel. So that's how all that's working. Moving right along to platelet aggregation, which we've been talking about already. What is it mediated by? What is platelet aggregation mediated by? That's all I want you to know. It's mediated by this fibrinogen. So a platelet has to stick to another platelet through fibrinogen, which is this right here. Okay? And once this platelet is already stuck to this surface here through von Willebrand's factor or, and, and uh, the glycoprotein 1B, 2A, then this fibrinogen right here is what links this together for aggregation. That's really all that's. And now, big thing here to know aggregation is inhibited. How do you think you inhibit this whole thing right here? It's inhibited by endothelial cells, which will be right along right here. Endothelial cells. See, it's all got backup mechanisms. These endothelial cells release something called prostaglandin 1, 2, or pro prostacyclin. This is also known as prosta. Cycling and nitric oxide. These two things right here is what inhibit platelet aggregation. Okay, and moving right along. So, so now we get to that 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 whole thing that everybody thinks that's all there is to it. No, so that's that's just primary hemostasis. Now we get into secondary hemostasis. This is the coagulation cascade. Secondary hemostasis is the coagulation cascade. So what's the goal here? That's to generate what? Generate a fibrin clot, or actually for the clot, I should say. Generate fibrin for the clot. That's the whole goal of this. So many coagulation factors are secreted as what? Inactive enzymes, and also known as zymogens. So upon activation, they become what? What Dr. Fitzovich talked about, serine proteases that can activate downstream factors. So that's how this is all starting to work. And this is where Brady Kynan um, cleaved, from, cleaved from high molecular weight kinin that vasodilates and increases vascular permeability. That's where all this is starting to come in. That's secondary hemostasis, not primary. So let me draw that in for you. It'll actually look like this. Calirinin, calicrin, calicarinin, and you got high molecular weight kinin to Brady kinin, and then that's going to be involved in plasminogen. See, these are all zymogens. Plasminogen getting activated. To plasmin. So you see how this is all starting to work? 
makes much more sense this way. So let's go back and talk about calcium and its cofactor. There are many, many, many reactions in the cascade that require calcium and platelet phospholipid <clears throat> as cofactors. So therefore, you know if you're hypocalcemic or you're hypercalcemic, you're going to be coagulating or you're not going to be coagulating. So that's how that whole concept ties in there. Um, 1972, we know this is a little mnemonic for what? Factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. These are all vitamin K dependent. So let me ask you something. How does warfarin tie in here? Warfarin, what it does is the synthesis of these factors here all made in the liver are all inhibited by warfarin. That's how that works. These see these cofactor or the not the cofactors, but the factors have to be made here in the liver. And that's what warfarin is doing. It's a vitamin K antagonist, which inhibits the gamma carboxylation step in the synthesis of factors two, seven, nine, and ten, as well as what is it? Protein C and S. That's why you have to start heparin first in case somebody has a protein C deficiency. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you the big secret. A protein C deficiency is nothing more than a factor five Leiden deficiency. It's a big secret in the medical field. I don't know why more people don't just say that. It would be a lot simpler if you thought of it that way. Protein C deficiency, factor five Leiden deficiency, you give somebody with a factor five line deficiency, which is by, by also the most common one, uh, warfarin without starting heparin first, you, they're going to be in big trouble. They're going to get skin necrosis, and that is your last warning sign before you're going to kill that patient. Because what are you going to do? You're going to see them clotting more, so you're going to give them more warfarin. Do not do that. Do not make that mistake. You will get malpractice. All right, so APC and antithrombin 3. So inhibition of the clotting cascade occurs, occurs, via activated protein C. That's what APC is, activated protein C. That's what inhibits the clotting cascade. And also antithrombin-3. Um, also TPA. TPA, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, disrupts existing clots. So that's why we give TPA to bust up a clot. Now, because protein C has the shortest half-life, its levels are quickly diminished when warfarin therapy is initiated, and that's what I was talking about with the whole uh, hypercoagulability thing. Okay, so now antithrombin 3, I wonder what he is. He's a serine protease inhibitor. Remember a second ago when we were talking about the serine proteases? So now I hope that's starting to make a little bit more sense, and we all know about TPA. So now we need to talk about thrombocytopenia. There are three basic causes. Number one is decreased platelet production. Number two, increased platelet destruction. Number three, increased platelet sequestration. Sequester. Sequestration. Okay, so when you decrease platelet production, that's characterized by what? Decreased megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. So give me some examples of decreased platelet production. How about aplastic anemia? That's a great one. Um, alcohol. Oh, that'd be a good one. Antineoplastic drugs. But here's the big one. Malignancy. I want you to think malignancy. That's the one people are going to miss. That's the one the board's going to ask you about. Decreased platelet production, malignancy, right? So they're bleeding. All right, so increased platelet destruction. You're going to get a peripheral destruction associated with increased megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. Of course, it's kicking out more of them. Um, a great example would be uh, bernard Soulier syndrome. How about DIC? How about drug-induced thrombocytopenia with heparin, penicillin, quinidine, methyl alpha, uh, alpha Methyl dopa. Um, some other examples we're going to talk about later on is hemolytic uremic syndrome, TTP, ITP. Uh, TTP, by the way, is thromb, uh, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic, purpura. We're going to talk all about that. But So let's talk about number three now. Increase, 
in increased a sonic Donald Duck increased platelet sequestration platelets are retained in the spleen when would platelets be retained in the spleen give me one example of that how about hypersplenism how about portal hypertension how about heart failure so that's how we get thrombocytopenic okay so moving right along, ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. This is an autoimmune condition. All right, it's caused by autoantibodies against the receptor glycoprotein 2B3A on the platelet surface. In children, it's usually following a viral infection and it's usually self-limited. Um, there's also antiplatelet antibodies that co-platelets, co but the big thing I want you to remember is look for thrombocytopenia with increased megakaryocytes in the absence of splenomegaly. That's your clue here for ITP. Let me write that in for you. Increased megakaryocytes. Absent. I don't know why they have to make it so hard. It's literally that simple. If I see this right here in a vignette, you have given me the answer. I know that's ITP they're going for. You're going to have a decreased platelet count. You're going to have an increased bleeding time because we're talking about platelets. And you're going to have increased megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. That is ITP. So moving right along to TTP. What do we know about TTP? Thrombotic, thrombocytopenic. All right, make sure you pay attention here because this is rare, but it's a life-threatening emergency characterized by a classical pentad of symptoms. First, you get a microangiopathic micro hemolytic anemia. That's what produces schistocytes. So let me write this in for you. Just bear with me. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is going to produce schistocytes. Number two, we're going to see thrombocytopenia. Number three, we're going to see renal failure. We'll come back and talk about why in a minute. Number four, you're going to see CNS changes. Uh, like your mental status. Number five, you're going to see fever. Do you ever see these five things all at once? Boom, right away. TTP. Now, how is, here's a very high yield fact. TTP and hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, are different. How do you differentiate them from something like, hmm, I don't know, maybe DIC? It's by a normal PT and PTT. That's how you differentiate these guys. That's all you got to remember is this pentad, and that's how you differentiate them, okay? They have a normal PT, PTT. Man, you just think of that, you're done right there. You're done right away. Go down and click TTP or HUS, all right? So due to a deficiency in von Willebrand's factor uh, cleaving protease, it's uh, also known as Adam. Adams T13. Um, the deficiency can be acquired, so like autoimmune uh, antibodies against Adams TS13. Um, you're going to have something. The big thing I want you to remember here is schistocytes, and you're going to have white microthrombi in the vasculature. Remember here, I'm just giving you the high yield, so if you want to go back and really read about these diseases and, and learn the ins and outs of them, that's fine, but I'm just going to give you a high yield, uh, high yield thing. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, classic triad, thrombocytopenia, microangiopathic, Hemolytic anemia, acute renal failure. Okay, 
This one's usually preceded by the whole big shigella-like toxin, uh, O157H7. Remember that bad boy? Yeah. Um, that's an e from an E. coli infection. So endothelial cells are damaged predominantly in the kidney. That's why you go into acute renal failure. So you're going to get platelets aggregating, forming these little microthrombi. And what's that going to do? You're going to get renal injury and you're going to get what? A uremia. It's literally that simple. So clot formation consumes platelets. You get thrombocytopenia. You get thrombi, shearing RBCs. Therefore, we get schistocytes and anemia. What more do you need to say? It's literally that simple. That explains every little bit of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So moving on to uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. All right, now to understand this, I mean truly understand it, not just memorize it, we're going to have to understand a couple things. Heparin binds to platelet antigen, which is known as platelet factor four, okay? Now, there's an autoantibody formed against the heparin platelet factor four complex. That's what gives you the type what hypersensitivity? Type two, type two hypersensitivity. These immune complexes induce activation of platelets. So patients become procoagulant and they're at an increased risk of uh, the thrombotic events. So that's what heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is all about. Just remember it's a type 2 hypersensitivity, and they might get into a little detail, but just they're procoagulant, okay? It's literally that simple. So now we're going to go on to platelet dysfunction. So, all right, talking about platelet dysfunction, this is some cool stuff. So these are qualitative defects, meaning that your platelet count, your PT, and your PTT are all going to be normal, but you're going to have an increased bleeding time. Okay, you got a platelet problem. Now, this bleeding is, is, is not due to the lack of platelets. Instead, there is a problem with platelet function. Problem with platelet function. Not due to the lack of platelets. This can be due to several things, several surface problem defects like Cox inhibition, clopidogrel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not going to get into that. But what we are going to get into is some um, coagulation disorders, and we're going to talk about a few other things here, like Bernard Souillet, Glansman's. So Bernard, uh, let's first talk about two adhesion defects, okay? You got two of them. You got Bernard Souillet and von Willebrand's factor disease. Now, Von Willebrand's disease, there's actually three types. I don't know for the boards what they're going to do here, but I think they're only going to ask you about type one. But I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and tell you there's there's three types. So we're talking about adhesion defects. You got number one, Von Willebrand's factor problem, or number two, Bernard. I love this disease, the way it sounds, Suye disease. Now, von Willebrand's factor, type 1, is autosomal dominant. What do you get for this? You treat this sucker with DD, AVP. That's the one I think they'd like you to know about, a desmopressin, an ADH analog, which releases von Willebrand's factor from those wobble palatal bodies that we all love in those endothelial cells. Now, type 2. He's also autosomal dominant. The big thing with him is you have abnormal von Willebrand's factor multiples. So if you got if you've got multiples that are abnormal, what's going to have a problem breaking those down? The serine proteases, Adams TS13. You see now type three, interestingly, is autosomal recessive now it's a severe von Willebrand's factor deficiency so you can't adhere to nothing and then Bernard so that's that covers von Willebrand's factor disease right there Bernard Soudier he's just a problem with glycoprotein um, 1b so you can't adhere there and you're going to have big B for big platelets 
okay? Um, and also, we got Glansman's disease. That's an aggregate. I didn't even write that in here because I don't really have room. But Glansman's disease, that's an aggregation problem. Glansman's is autosomal recessive, and that's the one where you have a problem with aggregation, glycoprotein 2B3A deficiency. So neighboring platelets can't form fibrinogen bridges to each other, can they? So note the similarity between these two. The only way you can tell the difference is the big platelets. And also note the similarity between the pathogenesis of Glansman's thrombocytopenia and which one of the other diseases I've talked about. ITP, okay? So um, some examples that you can get for aggregation defects is celecoxic, aspirin, anything that decreases thrombox Na2 through that COX pathway, like COX inhibitors, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about Glanzman's disease. So, all right, moving right along. Coagulation cascade defects. Unlike defects of primary hemostasis, defects of secondary hemostasis, which is what we're talking about, cause large vessel bleeding. So you're going to get something called like a large ecchymosis, a large, blue, a large bruise, or hemarthrosis. So... If you see an increased PT, it's caused by a deficiency of what we already talked about, fibrinogen, which is factor 1, 2, 7, 5, or 10. So you can remember that by 1752. That's if you see an increased PT. Now, if you see an increased PTT, that's caused by a deficiency of all factors except 2. What 2 do you think that would be? factors 7 and 13. That's PTT. Okay, so now we're going to talk about hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is a factor A deficiency. It's X-linked um, recessive with a variety of uh, variability of se severity, um, you're going to see an increased PTT, but all other labs are going to be normal. You're going to have a normal bleeding time. You're going to have a normal PT, yada, yada, yada. So that's how you're going to tell that you got a factor A or a hemophilia A um, or a factor A deficiency. Now, factor, uh, factor 9 deficiency, which is hemophilia B, the signs and symptoms are identical to hemophilia A, including the laboratory results so demonstrating the isolated PTT prolongation. Uh, so like hemophilia A, hemophilia B is also X-linked recessive. Now there's some keys to differentiating bleeding disorders, okay? So pay attention right here. If coagulation, number one, if coagulation cascade defects will have, they're going to have a hematoma, hemarthrosis, and bleeding at the circumcision. All right, so their labs are going to have increased PTT, normal uh, um, bleeding time. Normal PT is often found in hemophilia, but PT prolongation can occur with factor 2, factor 5, and factor 7 deficiency. All right, so I'm going to write all that down for you. Number one, coagulation cascade. Defects will have a hematoma or hematoma. The labs have an increased PTT, normal bleeding time. You're also going to have a normal PT, which is often found in hemophilia, but PT prolongation can occur with what? Factors 2. two, five, and seven deficiencies. All right, number two, platelet defects. I'm not going to say anything more than you're going to have an increased bleeding time, just like Dr. Francis says. You can get more complicated, but don't do it. Increased bleeding time with skin and mucosal surfaces. That's all you need to know. Number three, so bleeding caused by vitamin K dependent factor deficiencies. All I want you to think, man, is liver disease. That's all I want you to think because where's all this going on at? It's in the liver. 
so or like Coumadin therapy. So you're going to have an increased PT, an increased PTT, and a normal bleeding time. All right, so normal bleeding time, increased PT, increased PTT. So vitamin K deficiency, have you ever heard of that? Yeah, you have. That's the whole 1972. And in neonates, breast milk is vitamin K deficient. So in the GI tract isn't colonized yet with vitamin K. And that's what the whole hemorrhagic disease, the newborn thing is about. So we that's why we give every newborn vitamin K shots. So that's what that's all about. All right, moving right. We have already talked in depth about this, but we can go into a little more in depth. This is because this is why this is the most commonly inherited autosomal dominant disorder von Willebrand's disease. It's a combined primary and secondary hemostatic defect involving von Willebrand's factor. All right, so number one, what you need to know is von Willebrand's factor is chiefly in endothelial cells and to some extent in megakaryocytes. The von Willebrand's factor that is synthesized in megakaryocytes is stored in what granules inside the platelets? That could be a good one. So don't just remember wobble palatal bodies. Von Willebrand's factor is stored in the alpha granule of a platelet. Um, the von Willebrand's factor is synthesized, synthesized in endothelial cells and is stored then in the wobble palatal body. So in megakaryocytes, alpha granules, in endothelial cells, it's wobble palatal bodies. That's what you need to know about that. All right, moving right along. The Mo, boy, you need to know this guy, DIC. They're going to ask you 15 different ways about DIC. So DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation. Let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit. And I got a little mnemonic in here for you, even though I hate mnemonics. Um, it's a consumptive coagulopathy. Let me write that in there for you. Consumptive coagulopathy. Characterized by generation of fibrin clots. So you're going to be consuming uh, clotting factors and platelets. So what's going to happen is you're going to hemorrhage and you're often going to die from these hemorrhages. Now, note, it's not a primary disorder. DIC is never a primary disorder. Rather, it's a complication of several different disease processes. So you must always what? Don't go trying looking for a primary disorder. Say, oh, I got DSC. Look for the underlying cause. Look for the underlying cause. You must always, always do that. So let's talk about this mnemonic here. A stands for acute pancreatitis. You'll save somebody's life by doing this someday. T stands for trauma. The other one stands for transfusion reaction. The O stands for obstetric causes. A lot of pregnant women can go into DIC, man. You need to remember that one. Um, the other one, oh, the big, 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 big one, malignancy. And, of course, sepsis. Get that back so you can see it. So, acute pancreatitis, trauma, transfusion reactions, obstetric causes. Be, man, I'm always worried about pregnant women and DIC. Malignancy, you better believe it. And sepsis, oh, I'm definitely worried about DIC. You want to get these little microthrombi that can cause mechanical trauma to circulating red blood cells, so you're going to get something called what? Helmet cells. Because it's going around shearing my red blood cells. So when they normally look like this, they're going to be getting around and they're just getting knocked out, sure. And so you're going to get all kinds of messed up looking red blood cells. That's known as helmet cells or also schistocytes. You can say it any way you want it. So let's back up here a second. What's our labs going to look like for somebody with DIC? Well, we're going to have an increased bleeding time. Increased PT and an increased PTT because it's consuming everything. Okay, your your coagulation factors are down. Um, 
The two things that that um, are not going to be down are the cofactors, which is co which is factors five and eight. Factors five and eight are really not are really not coagulation factors. Factors five and eight, those are more cofactors than they are factors. So that's really all I'm going to say about that. But at least you know now. Acute pancreatitis, trauma, transfusion reactions, obstetric causes, don't forget that one. Malignancy, don't forget that one. And the one they love to test about is sepsis. So some way or another, you're going to get septic, man. You got to be worrying about DIC right away. So moving right along to HELOC Shyline Purpura. This is a small vessel vasculitis that commonly affects the skin. GI tract. Kidneys and joints. It's also characterized by what? IgA, anti IgA, immune complex deposition. Clinical symptoms are going to be proteinuria, renal symptoms, so you're going to see hematuria, you're going to see abdominal pain with the GI tract, you're going to see skin, uh, skin symptoms like palpable purpura and arthralgia in the joints. So that's Henlock Shaline Purpura for you, and you've seen plenty of pictures of it, I'm sure. So hereditary thrombophilia. This is hypercoagulability, also known as thrombophilia, so don't let it throw you. It's the most common cause of hereditary thrombophilia would be what, well, actually, it's not the most common. What do you think the most common is? We've already talked about it. It's a factor five Leiden deficiency, protein C deficiency. Factor five Leiden deficiency protein C deficiency. So the things that can do this, um, other things, um, an, another common cause of hereditary thrombo, um, thrombophilia is a mutant thro prothrombin gene called this, prothrombin. Remember, I'm just writing in the high yield things here. Prothrombin 2021-0A. I know, man, it's crazy. Elevated homocysteine levels. I asked Campbell about this. She wasn't sure why this can do this, but it can lead to venous and arterial thrombosis. Remember this guy right here. Venous and arterial thrombosis. Um, some more rare causes include protein C deficiency and anti-thrombin 3 deficiency. So there you go with that. So let's talk about acquired thrombophilia. This is hypercoagulability, also known as thrombophilia, but it's antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay, this is lupus, also known as lupus anticoagulant syndrome, and it's commonly tested. Um, it is a commonly tested acquired thrombophilia. In the bloodstream, antibodies directly activate platelets and complement. Directly activate platelets and complement. Patients commonly present with a history of like recurrent DVTs, recurrent miscarriages, that's a big one. Recurrent miscarriages is a huge one. Um, additionally, antiphospholipid antibodies can cause a false positive for syphilis. Be aware of that. And that pretty much uh, concludes everything you need to know about the physiology and uh, of hemostasis. You can go look at the, uh, the cascade. You don't really need to memorize that. Just know, if you know the high yields of this video, you'll be good when it comes to hematology and hemostasis and the physiology of acquired and all these diseases. Of ADP and platelet activation, ADP binds to receptors on platelet 